If you're a backend developer, concurrency is one of those things that will make you stand out from other senior developers. And it's quite a tricky topic, but as always, I'm gonna make it super easy for you. So the plan for today is the following. First, we're gonna try to understand what it is. We're gonna look at two approaches, pessimistic and optimistic concurrency, their trade-offs, and as always, the best practices. And before we dive deep into the code, as always, I want to make sure that we're on the same page when it comes to the theory. So we're gonna start with a bit of a theory first. So concurrency can be seen not only in databases, although our video is primarily about concurrency in databases, but it's basically about two processes, or in our case, transactions competing for one resource. So in asset compliant databases, concurrency is basically taking care of isolation. So what do I mean? Let's say we have one table called accounts, and obviously we have, we have many accounts. So if transaction A is trying to access one of those accounts, let's say account ID one, and it wants to update it, while transaction E is doing some work on this ID, the transaction B has to wait until transaction A is finished so that it can also do it. This is one of the ways to deal with concurrency or transaction B can actually go ahead and modify while transaction A is still running. Now, which way is better? This is the question and this is why we have two different types of concurrency and your job is to choose the one that fits your scenario the best. Now, when we talk about concurrency, it's not like we're talking about a specific app. Let's say Netflix is pessimistically concurrent and Facebook is optimistically concurrent. No, we're also not saying that Postgres is pessimistic and MongoDB is optimistic. No, we're really talking about specific actions within your application. For example, updating your user profile can be optimistically concurrent. Updating your bank account or topping up your account can be pessimistic. And we're gonna talk about this in a minute. So we're gonna start with pessimistic concurrency. What this tells us is that conflicts, or we assume that the conflicts are very likely to occur. So we're being conservative or pessimistic and trying to prevent them upfront. So what does it mean? Transaction A is trying to, again, modify one of the accounts as we saw above, and transaction B is trying to do the same. But let's take a look at transaction A. So this is basically how transaction A is gonna look like. We're trying to start the transaction with the begin, and then we're fetching or we're grabbing this ID one. And this is the keyword for us. So for update is basically doing uh, or putting a lock on a specific row. So this for update is basically locking one of the rows. In our case, it's the one that has ID one. And while we're updating here, accounts set balance. And so we're basically subtracting something from our balance. Transaction B literally has to wait until all of that is finished because we locked this row, okay? And once we commit, then only then transaction B can go ahead and do its things. Now within the code, it's going to look like this. So I'm using SQLize and Postgres. So this is the Docker Compose YAML file. As you can see Node and Postgres, you can uh, pull it from my GitHub page and run it yourself. We have a simple express app. We have two routes, optimistic and pessimistic. And I'm also crediting um, 100 bucks into my account right away. So the pessimistic is going to be like this. We have the withdraw endpoint and we're taking the amount from the request body. And this is where we're starting the transaction by running SQLized transaction method. And the interesting th thing is actually here. So when we find this account, which has ID one, the one that interests us, we put this parameter here, which is called lock. And as you saw in the row SQL example here, it's basically the same here. So lock update. And this means that this transaction is going to be pessimistic, okay, or with a pessimistic concurrency. And now we're having some checks if we have insufficient funds. And if so, then we're doing this subtraction, simple subtraction from the balance, then we save this transaction and then at the end we commit. Now, what are the typical use cases for pessimistic concurrency? Well, finances are a really good use case because we want to make sure that our bank accounts, balances in our banks are always consistent. It's not like I uh, add some money and then I pay for something and then I always want to see the correct 
balance that I have. Also inventory systems, when someone buys something with our shop, I want the inventory to always show the correct number and not have any lags. So the strength in this case are going to be that it's good for high conflict scenarios, for example, seat reservations, where a lot of people are trying to book your seats off the airplane and want the same data. And in this case, with a pessimistic concurrency, if we lock this row or the seat of the airplane, no one else is going to accidentally reserve the same seat. Also, if we want high data consistency, for example, in our bank account, and we're simply lowering the risk of needing to restart trans transactions because if one transaction is running, another one has to wait. Now, this brings us to weaknesses. It can cause blocking because the other transactions have to wait. Also, there's a chance of a deadlock. I have a video on deadlock, so if you're not aware what that is, go check it out. It's gonna be in the description below as well. And best practices, as always, are keeping the transaction short and making sure that the locks are fine grained. Meaning put the lock on the row like we did here on ID one and not on the whole table, obviously. Now at my current company in the last few months, I've been writing a lot of E2E tests. E2E tests are great for testing the user journey so that you make sure that the user journey doesn't break when you introduce a new line of code. But this whole process is very mundane. The only thing I've been thinking about all the time is why is there no app or platform that can automate writing and executing E2E tests? Well, this is until I stumbled upon our sponsor of today's video, Test Sprite. It works as an AI testing agent that connects directly into your IDE via its MCP server and handles the full testing lifecycle in eight simple steps. It understands your product requirements, analyzes your code base, then creates a test plan, writes the test, executes them, adjusts and reruns itself in a feedback loop if needed, and then produces consolidated results. So you can actually focus on development rather than trying to write tests and increase code coverage manually. What's useful is that it's not only limited to just one layer, it can validate front-end user flows, backend APIs, data consistency, and even agent-driven behavior across modern stacks like React, Node.js, Python, Java, and more. Developers won't be spending their time writing tests at all in the near future. So if you're already building faster with AI and wanna save even more time in your development, it's worth taking a look. And I've left a link below if you wanna check it out yourself. All right, now we come back to optimistic concurrency and let's see what the differences are. So in here, we're assuming that conflicts are rare Okay, instead of locking data immediately, we let transactions read and modify without locks, which can lead to conflicts, and also check for conflicts only at the commit time and not before doing any changes. Now, this assumes that we have a lot of read requests and not write requests, because when we're reading something from our database, we have lower chance for conflicts, while pessimistic concurrency is for the time when you have a lot of writes for example, booking something or reservation. Imagine Taylor Swift's concert, right? So in this case, we're going to have the following thing. By the way, this doesn't have to be a transaction, although it can be a transaction. It can also be normal query in this case. So let's take a look at what's happening here. So we're selecting something from accounts. And then as you can see, this is not a transaction. This is a simple update and a select command, right? Then we're updating our accounts table and just disregard this version thing. I'm gonna explain what that is in a minute, but we're basically setting our balance to some value and then also again, the version. I'm gonna explain that in a minute, but basically this is what transaction aided or query or command aided. And while this was running, transaction B modified the value of the accounts here in between the select and the update. So here, transaction B actually modified what we read. So we read one value and then before we even managed to update it here, it actually, the value already changed. So here's where the conflict is going to be happening. Is this good? Obviously not. So what you can do in this case is to make sure that you have an extra column here. So an extra column and it's going to be a version. And as you can see, we always increment the version every time we update it. And when we're updating the version, we want to make sure that the version matches the version that we expect. And if the value doesn't match, for example, we were expecting version one, but for some reason during the update, we saw that the version is two 
And this tells us, hey, someone actually modified our data while we were trying to make an update. And this is when you basically roll back your changes and retry. So typical use cases would be systems with many reads and fewer writes, distributed systems with the need for scalability, actually write down in the comments if you have any examples of where optimistic concurrency would be ideal. And by the way, looking at the code, the first thing that I really want to show you is the account. And this is our schema for the table. And the way you allow optimistic concurrency in SQLize is by adding this version true, which means our table is going to have this extra column called version version, which we can later use for resolving conflicts. Now we're going to have version all the time. And the optimistic example is looking like this. As you can see, we don't have a transaction. We're simply finding the account by private key ID, and then we're subtracting something. And then we simply do a save. All right, we're not committing anything, just account dot save and save is automatically going to do this check here, version equals the version that we expect under the hood. And it's doing it with the help of the fact that we said version is true. All right, as simple as that. Now, going back to the board, strengths are that there are going to be no locks and the higher concurrency and higher throughput, meaning a lot of read requests can go at the same time. Weaknesses are that if there is a conflict and if they're frequent, then a lot of transactions will be rolled back and this is a lot of CPU power, okay? And requires a good version tracking, meaning you should have some custom logic there if you're using this version that we saw, or you can also use kind of a timestamp of the database. So you need to have a robust logic for version tracking. And also best practices, as we said, you need to have versioning, your retries should be robust, and showing, telling the users that, hey, there's an error because we need to roll back to transaction. It's probably not ideal. You need to find a creative way of telling the users, hey, sorry, something went wrong. Please retry again. As simple as that. If you guys learn anything new, subscribe so that you see more videos like this. And I'm going to see you in the next one. Goodbye.